Hey everyone, my name is Thomas, and along with my colleague Tom, we're going to be covering how WebAssembly finally enables the dream of write once, run anywhere. I'll start by covering some of the basics and motivation around cross-platform development, as well as some of the specific partners that have found success with this approach. Then I'll hand it off to Tom to show some sample code and how to get started. Most of you probably know what cross-platform development is, but to briefly review, it's computer software designed to work in several computing platforms. In a traditional per-platform approach, you have to build your code distinctly for every platform you wish to target, whereas in a cross-platform approach, you compile to some intermediary, for example, the Java Virtual Machine, that then further targets the other platforms. This means that the intermediary only needs to get ported once per platform, and then all the code that targets that intermediary can be run there. This dream of write once, run anywhere is something that has been chased by many in the industry since basically the dawn of computing. Now, you might be asking yourself why we're talking about cross-platform in a Chrome talk. The web is, after all, the cross-platform solution that can run on any operating system. On top of that, you can make your web app even more native with technologies like PWA and advanced capabilities, which is a truly great solution and a viable option. However, the big drawback is that it limits you to JS, HTML, and CSS on all your platforms. This can be a big limiting factor if you have existing code in another language, want a fully natively written app for some platform like Android, or just simply prefer writing in another language. This is where WebAssembly unlocks your ability to use the same non-JS code from other deployments to also power your web app. So let's briefly cover some of the advantages of cross-platform development. One simple reason to use cross-platform development is to reduce costs. By using a single code base for all your platforms, you avoid having to re-implement every feature, and you can bring existing investments from previous platforms to new ones. One example I love here is the Google Inc. library, used for low latency drawing in a variety of Google applications. They had dozens of engineering years invested into this library and told us that without the ability to compile to WASM, they just simply wouldn't have a web solution for Inc., which would have left all of these products without features enjoyed by their native counterparts. Another way cross-platform development can save you cost is by enabling you to use the same code client and server side, such as with AI. Running AI on the server can be expensive and many computers can handle the operations locally. So by enabling the same code to run on both, you can dynamically decide where to run the code and even shift that over time. Here, you can see Photoshop Web performing AI-driven client-side object selection, while other, more intensive operations like generative fill are still done on the server side, though this could also shift in the future as client-side technologies develop. Another advantage is feature parity. When you use a single implementation to hit all your platforms, you also get the same features on every platform. Google Photos benefited from this with their photo editor, which uses C++ for all their deployments. This enabled them to quickly bring all the features from their native app to their web app and keep those features aligned across deployments as they developed. GoodNotes similarly told us this quote, which I really love that illustrates the advantage well. Every day, our iOS developers contribute something new to our Swift code base, and our web app benefits from that. Lastly, aligning on a cross-platform technology allows you to future-proof yourself. It's tough for anyone to say what futuristic platform might emerge, but by untethering yourself from any specific platform, you safeguard your investments. Right now, C++ is the most mature language for targeting WASM and most of the previous examples you saw used C++. Part of what makes C++ such a great choice is its high performance, especially when paired with threading and SIMD. WASM, along with SIMD, is used in XNNPack, which is the backing for both TensorFlow and MediaPipe for on-device AI operations. It's responsible for enabling blurred or altered backgrounds, as well as other fun effects in Meet. It's also responsible for noise cancellation, and you can really hear the difference in this example. Can you hear me clearly? It's getting it's critical. Now. It's critical. Let me update the figures in section 11.7 by 9 a.m. tomorrow. Another recent feature that really impressed me was AI-driven studio lighting, allowing you to set up artificial lighting with different colors in your scene. All of these features are performantly enabled on the web thanks to WebAssembly. This was just a brief overview, but we have an entire talk dedicated to AI on the web with my colleagues Deepti and Austin that I encourage you to check out through the link in the description.
Moving on from C++, there are now some additional language options that can target WebAssembly, enabling you to use them on the web. While there are many languages targeting WASM now, I want to focus on Dart, Kotlin, and Swift. Before going into each language, a consistent theme you'll see is whether to use cross-platform development for shared business logic or also using it for shared UI logic. So let me explain each. In the shared business logic approach, you use some common piece of code on each platform, but still remake the UI per platform. In the example of GoodNotes, they used their shared Swift code for the central document editing, but recreated the surrounding UI in React. Photoshop, Google Photos, and many others used a similar approach. In contrast, the shared UI approach uses the exact same code across platforms to generate identical UI. Sharing UI can clearly be a huge time saver, but currently almost all of these approaches paint to a canvas by shipping a rendering system along with the web app. This gives you great consistency across platforms, but also means a larger bundle size and does impact some functionality you get from the DOM, such as accessibility, extensions, auto-translate, and other browser features. Coming back to each language, Flutter uses the Dart language to deliver beautiful, high-performance experiences across mobile, desktop, and the web. Flutter on the web uses WebGL to create user experiences that are pixel-identical to native platforms. Now that Dart targets WASM GC, Flutter web applications have faster, more consistent timeframes. Check out the What's New in Flutter talk to learn more about Flutter, Dart, and WebAssembly through the link in the description. Another language option is Kotlin WASM, which also uses WASM GC and is now an alpha. Kotlin WASM also allows you to share business logic, such as from an Android app, or reuse your UI logic through Compose Multiplatform. Lastly is Swift and the Swift WASM toolchain. I covered some additional detail in our last year IO talk, which you can reference for further specifics, but this is a great choice if you have existing Swift code that you'd like to reuse on the web. It supports both shared business logic and has support for Swift UI via the Tokamak project. Tokamak lets you reuse your existing Swift UI logic, and unlike the other shared UI logic solution, it renders DOM elements, which sacrifices some pixel perfection for the benefits the DOM offers. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Tom to show you how to get started. Now, after seeing all of these amazing examples, you might be wondering how to get started with your code base. Obviously, your code base is your code base, and I can't just look into it and understand the constraints you may be operating under. This is why I decided to abstract away the low-level concepts and simplify the overall ideas based on a work example app. Meet Delayed Gram. It's a fictitious iOS and Android photography app. Don't actually look for Delayed Gram on the App Store or Google Play, but just pretend it is downloadable from these stores. Delayed Gram is all about award-winning image filters, like Invert or Grayscale. The user interface of DelightGram on iOS is implemented with SwiftUI. Apple presents SwiftUI as a modern way to declare user interfaces for any Apple platform. On Android, DelightGram's UI is built with Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose is Android's recommended modern toolkit for building native UI. The award-winning filters, Invert and Grayscale, though, are implemented in C++ for maximum portability and the best possible performance. Take the grayscale C++ file as an example. In its main function, it checks if it's called with two arguments, the name of the input file, argv1, and the name of the output file, argv2. By convention, argv0 is just the name of the command with which the program is invoked. It then calls the convert to grayscale function, where the real filter action happens. The function first obtains input and output streams for both files. It then reads the magic number of the ppm p3 file that the filter expects and writes it straight into the output file. Same for the dimensions, that is, the image's width and height. The next value is the maximum color value, which in this case will always be 255. Finally, the code hits the actual filter logic, where the secret happens. Here, using some magic numbers, remember, it's an award-winning filter. The code converts the red, green, and blue color channels to grayscale and writes the values to the output file. C++ compiles natively per platform. You can actually take each delayed gram filter, compile it, and run it locally in isolation. I've compiled both filters on my Mac to illustrate this. You can see that I can provide an input image file name 
hit a set output image file name, run the program, and out comes an image with the filter applied. Award winning, right? So how can Delaygram, an iOS and Android app, use these C++ filters from the native world that you've just seen me run on my Mac? On Android, it uses the Android Native Development Kit, NDK. iOS apps can get access to C++ through a platform-specific Objective C++ interface layer, and this is exactly what Delaygram does. Android and iOS only can get Delaygram that many users, but there's a ton of untapped potential for new users by bringing Delaygram to the web. Nothing is more frictionless than clicking a link. So what's needed to bring the full Delaygram experience to the web? For the user interface, of course, on the web there's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The real question is, how can the award-winning filters be used on the web? This is where mscripten comes in. mscripten is a complete compiler toolchain to WebAssembly using LLVM with a special focus on speed, size, and the web platform. It allows the Delaygram team to compile their C++ filter code to WASM so it can run on the browser. After some experimenting, the Delaygram team settled on the following compile command. EMCC launches the mscripten compiler. Minus O3 optimizes for production. Grayscale.cpp is the C++ input file, in this case for the Grayscale filter. And minus O Grayscale.mjs tells mscripten to compile to a JavaScript file with that name. By using the .mjs file extension, mscripten automatically creates an ES6 module. Delightgram runs filters exclusively in web workers, so the environment is set to worker. As file system enables file system support. The exported runtime methods are fs for file system access and call main to call the main function. Finally, invoke run equals zero, make sure that the main function isn't automatically called, but only when needed. After compiling the filters with mscripten, they are then ready to be used from JavaScript. To not block the main thread, each filter runs in a web worker. The filter gets the image's pixel data as a string in ppm p3 format from the main thread straight from the camera. It converts it to a file and writes it to Wasm's virtual file system, so the filter can access it from the Wasm filter's main function, just like on the command line before. After calling the Wasm filter's main function, the result is in a uniquely named file in Wasm's virtual file system, so all that remains is taking it out from there and sending it back to the main thread, so it can be drawn on a canvas. This is Delightgram, running on mobile as an installed progressive web app. Look at those gorgeous award-winning filters, now running in the browser. You can try this at home. Just point your browser at goo.gle slash Delightgram and play with those filters brought from C++ straight to Wasm in your browser. Next, this is Delightgram running on desktop with Chrome DevTools open. Here, I'm looking at the network tab and I'm inspecting the grayscale filters wasm file. Had I compiled with mscripten's debug flag, I could even debug the wasm code mapped back to the original C++ code thanks to the dwarf debugging standard. And with that, I want to hand it back to my colleague Thomas for some closing words and takeaways. Thanks, Tom. So, just to summarize some of the takeaways, WASM enables cross-platform development by supporting languages like Kotlin, Flutter's Dart, and Swift on the web. Many products are already getting the benefits from cross-platform development, like cost reduction, feature parity, and a future-proof platform strategy. And it's easy to get started with some of these different tool chains to try them out for yourselves. Just search for any of them and dig into the documentation. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>